Welcome to Kingdom Life Church and today's message with Drs. Dennis and Jennifer Clark brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its dedicated supporters. We are here to equip you with the how-to tools and practical effective ways for empowering your Christian journey. Join us as we explore teachings that bring healing through forgiveness and ignite transformation in both individuals and families. For more resources, join our mission. Visit us at forgive123.com. Let's embark on this journey together. Welcome to Kingdom Life Church and Full Stature Ministries. Um, proud to be up here again this morning, ready to, to, to hand you out some of the stuff that the Lord's been speaking to me over the last few weeks and months. Um, we're beginning, uh, we were beginning to get into the, the rebuilding process and the, and the building process of the Nehemiah No. Um, the last time that I spoke, and this is kind of goes along with it, but there's a, there's a, there's a situation where um, that's been happening over the course of probably the last 10, 20 years is what um, has been labeled uh, deconstruction. It's kind of the opposite of what we want to be doing right now, but there, there's a good side and a bad side, um, and and we'll get into that in one of the you know as we you know continue this series. Um, the series is going to be called Why Ask Why and the overweight brain. And I, I tapped into this series a couple years back, um, but since then the Lord's really opened up some um, some new stuff and new revelation that, that He wants to, us to share. Um, during this time, I felt that it was it was uh, kind of an important thing to share on um, after we just had this um, huge hurricane blow through, um, you know, the, the Carolinas and Tennessee and and, and everything, and a lot of people are, are asking that question, why? You know, if, if God is such a good God, why did he allow this to happen? You know, all of these little, um, well, big questions, deep questions that we have. Um, you know what, though, it starts when we're young. We learn what's called causality. Um, you know, it's why things work, you know, and that's how we were taught. We were, we, we were taught this is the effect of this is what happens when you do this, you know, you put your hand on the stove, you get burnt. Um, the interesting part about that is that if we take that into um, considering, you know, into our religious aspect, into our faith, um, it becomes sometimes problematic when we don't get the answers either right away or in the form that we like um, from, from God. And so then we go searching outside of the parameters that God has, has put in place for our, our safety and for our growth. Um, and we try to fill in the blanks. And you all know from filling in blanks, that just doesn't work, right? And we usually fill in the blanks with the darkest uh, parts. <laughs> Whatever missing information it is, we usually fill it in improperly. Um, at least I do. I don't know if that pertains to everybody, but most of us, I'd say, do that. So this part, the series that we're going to start, and it'll probably be a, three, be a three-parter, is Why Ask Why in the Overweight Brain. The part that I want to go over today is the, the, um, the overweight brain and the quest for control. The power and the problem of why. The question why. Why is one of the most powerful questions we can ask as humans next to what. <laughs> it's the question that derives curiosity, discovery, and understanding. As children, we learn to ask why as part of the natural process of growing and learning. It helps us understand the world, makes sense of its you know, causes and effects, and connects us with others. Doctors ask why to diagnose and heal. Scientists ask, ask why to explain natural world, and philosophers explore, they, they explore the human mind to the best of their ability and why they exist. But we understand all that, right? But while why can be a beginning, the beginning of insight and growth, it can also become a trap eventually. And I'll explain. When the need for answers become obsessive or driven by a desire for control, it leaves us with what I call an overweight brain. A mind that's bogged down by endless questions and unresolved fears. A relentless need to understand and control everything. And now, 
you know, it seems like that's really hard, uh, like a hard statement. But the reality of it, if you just sit and think about it for a while, and the source of why you're asking why, and why do you need to know, um, you'll, you'll see the understanding is that it's a need for control. It's a need to feel safe. It's a need, but it's your flesh doing it, right? Even if we're seemingly asking God why, the demand for it, right? In our quest to answer every why, we may inadvertently close ourselves off to peace, wisdom, and ultimately God's presence. Now, there's a difference between curiosity versus control. It's when why goes too far. Curiosity is natural, and God created us to be, you know, inquisitive by nature. Um, but there's a difference between curiosity that leads to growth and maturity and, you know, our curiosity that leads us to control. In childhood, why is often about exploring, like, why is the sky blue? Why is the grass green? Um, but then eventually, as we age, our questions often shift to be more complex, um, more subjective, personal matters. And at times we, you know, we ask why to demand control over a situation so that we understand what's going on. Um, we want to know why something happened so if we do it again, you know, we don't have the same results type of thing, right? We, it's a little bit more complex. Um, what we can do to avoid something, you know, um, next time. Why God allows certain things, um, just like what I was mentioning about, like the hurricane um, that had just happened. But we want to, because we want to feel reassured, we want to feel secure again, we want to feel, you know, but it's still the demand that's the problem. Our safety and our security and our peace comes with abiding. When we start to demand, we pull out of that abiding and we start to fill in the, with the flesh whatever we can to figure things out um, because we feel that the more we know, the better we'll be able to cope. When God doesn't really want us to cope, he wants us to be healed and move on. This shift just isn't about wanting to understand, it's about wanting control. When we begin to think that knowing why will make us feel safer, more powerful, more in control, we start relying on our own understanding rather than God's wisdom. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6 speaks to this, reminding us, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not to your own understanding, and in all your ways, acknowledge him, submit to him, and he will make your path straight. This is a gentle reminder that our understanding has limits. Our understanding has limits, a lot of limits. <laughs> our, our brains are only so big. And they sometimes actually lead us away from God's guidance. How why becomes a burden? Why, how has it become so heavy? Imagine carrying a, a huge backpack full of bricks. Every time that you ask a why question from the wrong source, from the need to control, or out of hurt or fear, it's like adding another brick. Eventually, that mental overweight feeling leaves you exhausted and weighed down carrying burdens that you were never meant to hold. You were never meant to hold these burdens. You know, when he says, pick up the cross and follow me, that is not this. These are self-made. This is the essence of the overweight brain, a mind filled with questions that don't lead to answers, but only add to the weight of worry and confusion. There's something that's been going on um, probably for, like I said, for the past maybe 20 years or so, where people are deconstructing their faith. Now, we've lost a lot of really top-notch top um, worship leaders, ministers of the gospel, writers. Um, a lot of people have literally walked out of their faith because they deconstructed their faith. Deconstruction was, was originally uh, created... Uh, the, the term, at least, was created by, I believe it was a French 
teacher, philosopher, who decided that he wanted you, he, he felt like tearing apart every word out of a text and searching it out as far as like um, the different, you know, inequalities or things that don't line up. Well, you know, you said this on this page was, was clearly stated this and then this page was not and tearing apart and that it, as a way of learning academically. It was never really meant to tear apart a faith. And that's where, where the, 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 the buzz phrase came from originally. Um, deconstruction. Um, there's a good and a bad to it when you deconstruct. And I'll get into this in one of the later parts. But there's a, the good side is, is that you can, um, it's time for like when the, when the Lord wants to repair some of the, the breaches, some of the cracks in our foundations, some of the things... We ask the Lord to fill those those voids, those gaps, and 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 get healing in the areas that that we can move on from. Right? It's like tearing up the the, the old floorboards and and you know recreating those things and building our faith and growing. That 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 would be the purpose of deconstruction deconstruction in a good way, is which is a mindset of reconstruction eventually, right? Unfortunately, deconstruction usually follows the negative path. And, and doesn't bounce back, you know, outside of the intervention of the Holy Spirit and community. So anyway, that's what deconstruction is. You'll hear that throughout um, the next couple teachings. The mental weight that I, I, I call this mental weight as far as the why questions, kind of like bunny trail thinking. And we're familiar, we're all familiar with some of the bunny trail thinking that happens like when we're trying to do the 60 day challenge and we're sitting, we're praying, we're like, oh, did I water the plants? Oh, I need to get gas in my car. Or, you know, that's, I call that rabbit trail thinking. You can just kind of go off and then you're like, all of a sudden you're, you're too tired or you can't move, you know, it happens to all of us at some point, right? Especially when we're tired. But when the when they're when they're more serious and they become more are left undealt with uh, questions of like why questioning God and his you know his all knowingness why did he do this you know why did he allow this to happen or why did he do this why am I sick why is this happening why is there bad weather you know it could be just about anything the problem with the why questions is is they're never really answered I mean. You can, you can go down that hole like forever and, and that would be from the bunny trail thinking in order you know down the rabbit hole um, of despair, so to speak. Um, it, can, it can often lead to one of the worst questions that, 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 are, uh, that you could ever ask and continue asking is what if? <laughs> the wise can end up you know, pushing you to the what ifs and what you do not want to get stuck in the what ifs. It will drive you literally insane because you cannot ever come up with the outcome for every single what if in your little puny mind ever. So it's totally wasted time, wasted thinking. What if, what if it's hypothetical. What does it mean? You know, what does this mean for my future? What if I'm not good enough? Uh, you know, all, all of those things. Eventually, they, they can get stuck in part of a, a, you know, a false personality. You know, it's just, you don't want to get stuck there. At any point that you find yourself in the, in the whys and the why God and, and things and the what ifs, please recognize where you're at and repent right there on the spot. Lord, I don't know and I can't claim to know. I receive forgiveness for going there and get your peace back. You will know for sure because you will not have peace in the what ifs. You will not have peace if you're demanding answers to why questions. One of the things that you'll find is not just you won't have peace, you'll, you'll worry a lot. You'll be one of the worriers. And some people think that that's, that's just who I am. But other people, you know, as a badge of honor, I worry about everything, which means I love everything. I love everybody. I love my family. I worry about them all the time. And that's just not true. That's not love. That's just worry. 
worry is in, in this dark type of thinking, worry in, in the darker thinking and going down that, that, that rabbit hole um, is kind of like uh, holding a mirror up to another mirror. Have you ever like trying to see like the back of your head or something in a mirror using another mirror? You can see a reflection, the, the exact copy is on the first one, but then it just goes on and on and on and on and forever. It's, it's, um, it's, it has a scientific, this, well, the scientific name for it is infinity mirrors. Infinity mirrors means that it sees itself and produces a picture of itself for as long as light can touch it and bounce between the two mirrors. The interesting part about that is just like worry, just like asking the, 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 the whys, um, it is like an, it just goes on for infinity. It can keep you stuck in an endless loop until it just gets darker and darker. And if you do notice, if you ever did that, if you, you're going to go home and do that, right? Check it out. It's really cool looking. But it, it, just say it's a science, a science experiment or something. But what happens, like I said, it will repeat the picture over and over again until some type of, you know, uh, problem with the mirror itself, if there's a defect, or the light quits bouncing between it. There's just loss of light. So it just gets darker and darker. Just like our thinking does if we stay in that endless loop. And it can. And the good note about that is at any point, you can get back. There's always hope. And that's what's incredible about God and his mercy and his grace, right? The reflections of, in the infinity mirrors distort our perception of reality. Just like our attempts to answer the profound why questions that can, they can lead us to different interpretations and perspectives. The idea that our understanding is often shaped by our viewpoints and what we consider truth may be merely one of the reflections. What we consider truth. Now, what, would, what did we just do there in that statement? The why questions, the demand to know. We just created our own truth. We are creating our own evidence. We're, create, we're, we're, being, we're becoming our own God. This is idolatry we're slipping into. As if we could understand everything like God. Ultimately, the, the reflections in the mirror will fade and become less defined. It's also the nature of our philosophical questioning at that point, right? Because it's, it's theory. We might seek clarity and you know, definitive answers, but the deeper we delve, the more elusive those answers become, revealing the limitations of our own puny brains. What's interesting, though, is if you Im start to embrace the fact that you will not, you will not, may not ever know the reasons why certain things happen, even if you feel that you are justified in your knowing. If you embrace the fact that you may never know, and it's okay, and you give that back to God, those reflections basically can they, they symbolize the the. the Although there's an uh, uncertainty, you're allowed to be, you're allowed to move on from it. There's a sense of not knowing the answers, but you're allowed to move on. You're allowed to continue in your relationship with the Lord, even though you can't grasp all the details and it gets darker. How do we do that? What is that? What does that look like? It's humility. That's all. We we if you humble your you just humble yourself before the Lord and. Uh, and say, how are you going to work this out? How are you going to work this out, God? And then just, and you wait for him. And with a humble spirit, not a demand to know how to fix things yourself, how to move on, how to do this and that. But just ask God, how is God, how, how are you going to work this out? Because I don't see it, you know, but I know that you're a lot smarter than I am. That's really the only way out of looking through that mirror, right? But when we talk about worry, and I want to go back to worry, 
it's really a disguise for overthinking and dark thinking. Worry often disguises itself as harmless, right? It's just I'm overthinking or a little bit concerned, but it's often much more. Some worry becomes almost a duty, maybe a badge of honor, like I said, even a way showing responsibility that you, to love one, to love people. That's like a responsibility to worry then. Um, but that mindset says, if I don't worry, I must mean I don't care. And, and honestly, coming from, a, from a, an Italian background, I don't know if, if everybody's like this, but ethnically, if you, don't, if you don't worry about your kids and worry about life and worry about everything all the time, it means that you don't love. You're unloving. You know, and that's what I, that's how I grew up. So I, I, I really relate. But I also understand that that isn't love. For others, worry is so ingrained it feels like there's a it's a part of their identity. It's just who I am. It's I've, I've always been that way. I've been a worrier, um, but that's not who God created us. That's not the new creation. We don't have to identify with that. Um, this is just a belief that you you took on, in, you know, inadvertently and let it grow. Um, but it, <clears throat> it, it, it's actually a false identity, you know, it gets to that point. Worry isn't love. Moms, dads, and caregivers often feel like worry is proof of their commitment, but worry is not the same as love. Instead, worry burdens the mind and heart with an endless sense of responsibility that God never intended us to carry. If, you have, if you're taking notes, I want you to write the, the, my definition of worry. And I hope that this sticks for some of you guys. <laughs> worry is what happens when you have done everything within your power, even all that you're responsible to God for in stewardship, but you continue thinking about it as if there's still more you can do. Worry is what happens when you have done everything within your power, even all that you're responsible to God for, but you continue thinking about it as if there's still more that you can do. This cycle of concern creates the illusion of control, keeping you trapped in a mindset that blinds you to God's peace and his presence. Don't get stuck in the worry trap because what happens is it will eventually blind you to God's peace and presence. Worry might be one of the heaviest weights that we carry, adding layer upon layer to our already overweight brain. It often starts small, like a stray thought of what if, a little bit of uncertainty. But worry has a way of building on itself, turning one concern into a web of anxieties that grow bigger, heavier, and more complicated with every day. When we allow worry to control our thoughts, it shapes our perspectives, drawing us away from peace and trust in God's promises. We start relying on our own understanding, convinced that if we just think through every possible outcome, we can somehow gain control back. Yet this approach only leaves us feeling more weighed down, caught in a cycle and fearful, repetitive thoughts, repetitive thoughts. Proverbs 12, 25 says it well, Anxiety in a person's heart weighs it down, but a good word makes it glad. Worry fills our minds and with anxieties and uncertainties that leave no room for the good word of God's peace and presence. Feeding on the overweight brain, worry, it feeds itself. It creates an endless loop of questions, doubts, imagined outcomes, everything that you could think of. We try to find answers, but as we delve deeper, the worry grows. This, <clears throat> we start asking questions like, what if this doesn't work out? What if I'm not prepared enough? Soon we end up carrying the weight of every hypothetical problem that we could even think of. This constant worry takes a toll 
not just mentally but spiritually. It distracts us from the truth of God, that he's in control, and tempts us to focus on what we can see and control rather than trusting in his sovereignty. Jesus addresses this directly in Matthew 6, 27, when he, he asked, Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? This reminder is essential because worry, no matter how intense, does not bring change to the future. It only diminishes our capacity to experience God's present presence in the present. It's a substitute for trust. I mean, this basic, right? Worry isn't just a mental or emotional problem, it's a spiritual one. When we allow worry to dominate our thoughts, we are essentially placing our trust in our ability to manage outcomes instead of placing our trust in God. And hey, we might be able to manage outcomes like pro, but you know, some of us can, and they can get away with it for a long time, but do you really want to? How about, let's put our trust back in God. You know, it's like, if I think about this long enough, I could handle it. You know, I could come up with a solution. But true peace doesn't come from understanding every detail. It comes from knowing who holds everything together. Right? For a C temperament like me, who thrives on detail and data, um, it can be easy to fall into, I can handle it if I just think it through, right? Just think it through to the end. But it's not true. It's, it's just not true. We need to find the peace that only God provides. In Philippians 4, 6, and 7, it offers a clear invitation. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Very popular scripture. If you don't know that one by now and you've been coming to the church more than a week, <laughs> two weeks, <laughs> that one should be in our hearts written on the tablet. Trust over worry. The way to combat worry is not only just, you know, out of the humble heart, but we must practice surrendering all of our detailed management skills to God. We need to be able to surrender all of that, handing our fears and our uncertainties over to God and trusting that He is capable of handling what we cannot. When we do this, we unburden our minds and make room for God's peace. Instead of worrying about the future, we can focus on what God is doing in the present, trusting that He is faithful and His plans for us are good. When we let go of worry, we can approach our lives with a lighter, more open mind, open heart, and a good godly disposition. This shift prepares us to embrace a healthier emotional state. I'll get to that in a moment. Moving away from the burden of fear and closer to freedom in faith. With worry laid down, we are ready to explore the four moods. I'm going to try to take you over to this chart and make some sense of it. It's kind of riddled with hieroglyphs <laughs> instead of writing. My writing is a little Eh, questionable. But we're ready to explore these four moods and, and the way that they influence our thoughts and emotions, helping us to better understand how to align our hearts with God's peace and get back out of that spiral. Um, and I'm going to... And while we think we're getting closer to peace by searching for answers, we often end up feeling even more unsettled. Ecclesiastes 1.18 says this, for, for with much wisdom cuts, comes much sorrow. Ecclesiastes is so awesome, right? It's the one I go to when I need cheered up. <laughs> for with much wisdom comes much sorrow. The more knowledge, the more grief. That's so, that's so terrible, right? But, but in that respect, it is. If we're looking in the flesh for those things, that's the way it always ends up. Our outlook and our mood 
will actually begin to change depending on our perception and what we do with it, which direction we go. The four moods and how why can shape our emotions and mindset. I've never used this chart. As we explore how the endless pursuit of why can become a burden, it's important to recognize how the questioning impacts our emotions and mental state. At any given time, our minds operate under a certain mood or tone all the time. And, if, <clears throat> and what we want to do is we're going to explain the four moods, kind of like seasons, um, and our experience and what, what we're doing um, in, in our Christian walk. Um, and how they influence the way that we interact with our relation, how they interact with our thought, our thinking, or our, and our asking questions, and with our relationship with God. So, the indicative mood. Number four. I mean, that's that's number one. <laughs> number four. We'll start with number one this time. Number one is called the indicative mood. The indicative mood is going to be here at the top of the chart. This is where we start. This is this is like right when we get we first you know receive forgiveness and we're washed clean and we are born again. It's like that. It's like that. The, the sky is bluer, the, green, the grass is greener, and and everything that you ask of God comes to pass like within minutes. Or you know, it's one of those things. Especially if you've been you were saved uh, later in life, um, you because you could see the the contrast so clearly as to what you were before and what you are now as a believer. That's the indicative mood. It's, it's open. Um, it's a state of openness and wonder. It's often experienced as a fresh, joyful look at, uh, or outlook on life. Um, for many, this mood is like the joy that they feel after salvation. When life feels brighter and the world seems renewed and everything is infused with hope, um, it's in that state where we are open to God's presence and our hearts are receptive to His guidance and love. So we want to like stay there. Is that possible? Yeah. If it's if, if we fall out of that, there's it's there's always a way back. Amen. But this is where why questions come from a place of like curiosity and awe and the fear of God, not the fear of con, you know loss of control. That would be the indicative mood. What happens though as we mature, well as we get older in our faith and we're you know partially developed, but God takes us through a growing process. This particular, this particular way that I, I have on the chart is, it goes indicative, imperative, subjunctive, and then optative. And then eventually it goes back. But what, but the ex explanation, I'll, I'll take you through each of the explaining. But the indicative is what we usually start out with. This is where we, we can experience the fruit of the Spirit, that we have our relationship with the Lord, and then, you know, every time that something has, you know, happens that makes us doubt or, or, or disengage with God in abiding, um, we, we learn in the church is to receive forgiveness for, for going there to the imperative mode. Disappointment, right? We receive forgiveness for that disappointment. Anything that's discouraging, all the hell flags, the H flags, right? Hurt, fear, lust, anger, guilt, shame. Any of those things, we receive forgiveness and we go back. And we try to stay in that loop to the best of our ability. And most of what we teach, this is where we're at. The imperative is the demand. Well, first let me give you the, the scripture reference for the indicative mood. would be, you show me the paths of life. In your presence is fullness of joy, and at your right hand are pleasures evermore. That would be like Psalm 1611. In that mood, we trust that God is with us and our questions come with a sense of safety, knowing that His presence is near. We can rest in God's promises and the feeling that each question is a path to a deeper intimacy with Him. Don't you want to stay there? Unfortunately, things happen. Life happens. Situ you know, situations happen out of our control. We become into... We can easily fall into an imperative mode. An imperative mood is, is here between disappointment and doubt when we don't deal with the hell flags and it continues on. The imperative mode, mood, or mode, 
is when the spirit of openness shifts to a need for control. That's where the worry starts happening. I'm worried about this. I'm worried about that. And, and you're pulling out of God's presence. You're breaking away from abiding. And then worry starts. That's when you're in the imperative mode. And what happens is it's driven by willpower and a desire to take matters into our own hands. And that is even doing and, you know, trying to be a Christian, trying to walk the Christian walk the way that you believe it is in Scripture to the best of your ability. Now, what happened was, is we're slowly uh, in the imperative, we're, we're slowly doubting um, our relationship with God. Because what happens is that we're separated, so it's easy to look from a different perspective and say, oh, I'm not abiding anymore. And you start seeing that things skewed. So we have to make them work. It's like, oh, I don't feel that joy anymore. Oh, I don't feel that. But I got to be the Christian that they believe I am. I got to get up there and, you know, preach a good sermon. I got to, you know, go to work and, you know, be the best example of a Christian that they could be, you know, I could be. Uh, but it's in the flesh, and that's religion, dead works, and very tiring. We might find ourselves striving or working hard or pushing others to fit into our expectations. We don't do that, right? Rather than trusting God's grace, we fall into a performance mindset trying to make things happen in our strength. Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. Jonah 2, 8. Jonah. Good story. Operating in this demanding mood can lead us to make idols of our own efforts, even the demand to know why. It makes an idol out of our intellect or even the answers that we seek. We might feel frustrated, restless, or even bitter when things don't go as we expect. I mean, bitter, restless, frustrated, does that sound like you're in God's presence? Instead of relying on God's grace, we find ourselves forfeiting the peace and freedom that come from surrender again. But at any point, if you surrender, God, I am out of control and I need, I need to go back. And he's willing, he always, he always takes us back. If we remain in that imperative and we start failing, what happens is we get too tired to keep up the facade. The, the religious, it's too hard to be a Christian. And we start even more doubt sneaks in. And we start delving in the subjunctive mood. That's disillusioned. The subjunctive mood is marked by disappointment, discouragement, and despair. This is where the weight of the unanswered questions and the unmet expectations start to weigh heavily. And when we dwell in this mood, our hope feels deferred and the heart begins to feel sick when the frustration of unmet desires Are prominent. Here the why questions are turned inward, echoing feelings of disillusionment and doubt. We may question God's goodness or struggle to see his hand at work in our lives at that point. And once the clear path becomes murky and uncertain, we feel stuck. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, Proverbs 13, 12. In this state, our questions no longer are constructive. They lead down a path of disillusionment and dark thinking. We become prone to discouragement, feeling that no answer or assurance will ease our minds. This mood often traps us in a cycle of doubt where we replay our frustrations and disappointments rather than seeking God's perspective and replaying all of his goodness in ways that he has already come through for us. Replaying those episodes, we don't do that anymore. That subjunctive um, mood 
is pivotal. It's, I say it's pivotal, it's because what you do here will determine what happens later. So at any point, I'm actually, I, I beg you at any point, if you see you're at any point, please, you know, repent and get right with God. You'll be so much happier in the indicative <laughs> or, or the optative. <laughs> but when you're in the subjunctive, you have, a, you, you have a, a, a pivotal moment of deconstruction can happen, right? That's when you feel broken, you feel betrayed, you feel um, that you want to reevaluate and you're, and you're searching for, for other sources outside of the Bible about God. You're looking at Instagram and TikTok and, and looking at all these people. And what happens, okay, first you question. That's what starts the disappointment. Maybe this is too hard. Maybe this is just me. Then you start to isolate in your doubt. You isolate. You question. You isolate. What happens when the Bible says people separate themselves? They seek their own. They seek their own desires to fulfill a need. You become apathetic, disengaged, withdrawn as you isolate and you wrestle with God. A lot of people call this the dark night of the soul. <laughs> it's bad. It's a bad place to be away from God. But that's when deconstruction thought is, is usually when people talk about it. And I, I recommend not looking it up, but there's so much on it um, about how to do it. How, can de how do you deconstruct your faith? How can you be a non-Christian? I mean, there's stuff out there that's sick like that. But you're still in the, the subjunctive mood. What, what you do, like I said, what you do from there, you could either go to the op optative, which is hope, or you go right into disbelief and eventually unbelief, which is you're losing your Christian faith altogether. And that's where, unfortunately, this is where a lot of people have ended up because the dark, the dark way of thinking, it just seems like it's such a big, it's just a rabbit hole that it just consumes you. And a lot of people don't feel like they can get out of it because what this is all brain. This is all mind stuff. If you don't deal with the emotions first, the fruit of the Spirit, I mean, you, you don't get the fruit of the Spirit after you deal with the hell, hell flags of the emotions, you're stuck in your head. You're deconstructing your brain. You're a fat brain. You're 60% fat brain, 20% protein. Y'all are fat heads. No. It's true, 60% fat. Uh, but... Um, and so, yeah, we don't. We want to look at in this series that we're we're doing. We're going to look at how all of this happens, and when we get to this point where deconstruction, what we do, you know, what what do we do if we if we if we landed here, and we just become atheist? I mean, what happens? How, what happens if you know somebody that's this way? We're coming, you know, across more and more people that, especially the younger generations, they, they get all of their. God information off of Facebook and YouTube and anybody can post anything and it's it's terrible it's it's sick and twisted but then you know you get why you don't have to tithe why don't you why you don't have to go to church why do you you know need to rethink Jesus because he you know contradicted himself 18 times or why did you you know don't look that stuff up it's terrible I mean you know they it's, it messes with your head. All of this can be solved through relationship. All of it. At any point. If you surrender, all of it can be resolved with, with relationship. The optative mood. If you're in the subjunctive and you actually say, hey, I, 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 I don't know where I, I, I've been going. I, I, need, I need God, Father. I, I just need you. I, and, I, and I receive forgiveness for all this garbage, and I want your thoughts, because they are higher than mine. You get to the optative. It's the restoration of hope. It's, it's where you begin to doubt your doubts. This is the, this is the fun part. <laughs> you doubt your doubts. 
What if I could be wrong? This is one of the first things that I, I, I learned when I came here. And, and, and I was watching everybody interact and all the, 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 the good couples and the people that were happy. And I'm like, I know that they don't think the way that I do. But they're so much more happier than I am. <laughs> Something Maybe I could be wrong. Right? I doubted my doubts. I, I went against what I thought was true in the first place, but then I began to doubt my doubts <laughs> about how things should be going. The optative mood marks the beginning of, re of a renewed hope. In this mood, a sense of possibility reemerges. The I could be wrong, you know, the, and, and hope once deferred starts to come alive in our hearts again. Here, the why questions are no longer demands, but gentle prayers desires expressed to God with a heart open to his timing and his wisdom. We may not have every answer, but we feel the stirring of trust and faith in us. In this state, our hope finds its root in God. And when we lean into that possibility that he is working all things together for our good. Hope deferred the, makes the heart sick, but when the desire comes, it's a tree of life. This mood allows us to reconnect to the joy of knowing that God has a purpose for our questions. Even when we don't have all the answers in the optative mood, we begin to let go of control and allow hope to blossom again, knowing that God will provide clarity and direction in his time. Each of these moods shapes the way that we relate to God in our questions, you know, why questions. Depending on the mood that we're in, we, they can either draw us closer to God or push us further away from his presence, as you have seen. Recognizing which mood that we're actually currently operating in allows us to see where our questions are coming from, whether grounded in trust in God or grounded in despair and hopelessness. If we find ourselves in the imperative or subjunctive moods where control and disillusionment drive our questions, it's a signal to turn back to God and seek a shift in our heart motives, in our hearts, right? Moving from these statements or these particular states, right, back to the optative or indicative mood, it involves surrender. Every time it involves surrender and allowing God and the Holy Spirit to do the work in us. Surrender. His presence can bring joy and peace back, even amidst the, the unanswered questions. Embracing the hopeful path. By becoming aware of these moods, we can better understand what I believe, where the why questions come from and how to move through them in a way that aligns us back with God's truth and to his heart. Instead of allowing unanswered questions to weigh us down, we can let them be a pathway to deeper intimacy with Christ. In doing so, we find rest and peace, trusting that his presence is, there's fullness of joy, and in that each season of questioning can lead us closer to him in growth. And that's really the only, the, 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 the main thing that God wants us to be able to do through this, because all of us go through seasons of, of certain amounts of these things. They're like without our, they're not in our control, a lot of them. The ones that, are, but, but the ones that are, please repent, just repent and, and move on. All of this is meant to, to help us grow, not to destroy us. Now, there's a difference between deconstruction and destroy. There's a deconstruction, there's, there's, there's pulling up the floorboards, there's doing what, what you know, the things that, uh, getting rid of religious um, garbage and things out of our lives. That's, that's a form of deconstruction. And there's a difference between that, but but this is this is destroy, you know. This is this is like you know the kids have used Legos all the time to build, and 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 you can build up walls, you can build houses, and, and what have you. Deconstruction really is is taking and block by block away, and and put in, you know and changing parts and doing things. But this is destruction, and, and we don't want to stay on that path.
One of the greatest risks of an overweight brain is that it blocks our ability to, to apply godly wisdom. It's like the more knowledge that we consume, the less wisdom we have room for. It's, it really is. When we constantly are pursuing knowledge for its own sake, I should say, just to know more, right? Maybe, maybe it's in a way to control our lives or, or you know, we, we miss out on what God has to offer. In 1 Corinthians 8, 8, 1, Paul says, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Knowledge alone doesn't bring peace. It often just fills our minds without transforming our lives. True wisdom isn't about knowing everything. It's about knowing how to live in alignment with God's guidance. Godly wisdom requires a willingness to surrender our need to understand everything. It's about trusting that God's knowledge surpasses ours and that He will reveal what we need to know when we need to know it. <laughs> we may never know everything, right? And He might not share everything. Some of the stuff isn't for us to know, even though we feel like it is. But He will let us know everything that He wants us to know in when he wants us to know it, in his time, if we remain in relationship and abide with him. Otherwise, you can't. How would you know? That's the whole thing. Godly wisdom requires a willingness to surrender our need to understand everything. When we can let go of the why questions that weigh us down, we create space for God's peace to fill us. As Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. In our culture, sometimes we, we place such a high value on knowledge that we're constantly told the more that we know, the better the off that we'll be. The more that we know, the more empowered we'll be. The more valuable you'll be if you just go to, you know, 20 years of school and you'll be more valuable to people, you know, to society. Um, it really is an, it's a, it's a, it's a focus and an emphasis on the pride of sophistication, really, is what happens. The belief that knowing, knowing is what matters most and, and that by knowing more, we can somehow elevate ourselves above others, sometimes even above God, right? That only happens in like the superhero cartoons that like my kids watch. I could be better than God. Oh, I'm stronger than, you know, whatever. But that pride is a subtle and powerful and it feeds the mindset of, I know better, or I have this figured out, or I can figure it out, right? But that leads to just destruction and disillusionment. One of, one of the things that, that comes across, because when you stay on this side of the chart and you go into the deconstruction and you're starting to go this way, it's because of the pride. What happens is because you, you have gone without God for so long, you have to have pride in something, and what you know is like the only thing. So a lot of these people that deconstruct, they're like encyclopedias of information and toxic junk. You can, they, can, they can talk forever, and you'd be completely slimed by the time you're done talking to them, <laughs> if you allowed. But the thing is, is what, what happens is because after they isolate, they actually then come back out of isolation. That's the interesting thing that I'm finding. The people that are in this deconstruction mode, they are, they are determined to share with you their truth after they found it. And it, could, and it could be really wacky. I mean, it is not, I mean, it's not just another gospel. It's like a whole other universe uh, sometimes. But, they, but they're not afraid to show you. They're not. And that's, that's what's scary about it, the pride. Uh, in, in the, in the, and, and then people will follow them because they're assertive or you know, determined to, to get a, their points across. Um, people will think that, well, they know something that I don't know. And that's scary. But the thing is, is you go from questioning to isolation to then in your disbelief and your deconstruction, you expose to others. But these people are usually at that point done with church, done with believers, altogether. 
But if you go to exposing from others and you go on that side where God is going to take us back to the indicative mood, you find hope from this deconstruction effort. It's because you're exposed to God. You expose yourself to God. Lord, I've, I'm, I've done all of these things. It's just like the, the, it's like the sinner's prayer over again, right? This would be like where you would do the selfish prayer, <laughs> right here. <laughs> Lord, I've been living on my own. I've been living in my flesh. I've been doing it all on my own. I need you so much. And he goes back. So, exposure to others, exposures to God. Others, they find in the same element where they're deconstructing. Birds of a feather. It's, it's, it's not cool. The problem is, is when they start getting frustrated and, and angry, because... Most all of these people are not happy. Nobody's happy over here. They can pretend. But when they find out that their truth doesn't match my truth, and I can't make them believe the way I do, everybody has a different truth, they, they, this is the breakdown. It's the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Yeah, it's the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You're right. Isn't that, it's, it's sad. The tree of knowledge and good and evil was in the, in the direct center of the garden. Why do you think that was? You know, Adam and Eve had to walk past that thing every day while they were there. Pretend it wasn't there. Remember that, what God told them. As soon as she thought it was, would make her wise, was pleasant, was maybe good to eat, they had all these other things, God's provision all over around them. But they decided, she decided to take apart what she wasn't allowed to have. It was kind of like when I, I deconstructed the cable box when I was seven years old. I couldn't figure out how to put that back together. I think we were fined like 75 bucks for it. <laughs> Something we didn't have at the time. <laughs> but yeah, you don't want to deconstruct without the, without the uh, concept of... of you're, going, you're, you're doing this because you're getting rid of the junk because you want to have a better relationship with God. You want to grow. Amen? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to end there. I, I know I have quite a bit more, but let's just pray. Lord, we thank you, Father, for being God, the one who knows all things, for seeing the big picture when our mind feels weighed down by questions and uncertainties, help us release our need for control and to trust your wisdom rather than our own understanding of things that we can gather. Teach us to let go of worry and embrace the peace that only you can give. As we navigate our wise, may we draw closer to you, finding comfort in your presence and resting in your promises. Guide us in surrender, Father, and fill our hearts with the assurance that you hold all things together. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us. You've been listening to Drs. Dennis Clark and Jennifer Clark from Full Stature Ministries. To explore more life-transforming resources, and deepen your faith journey, please visit us at forgive123.com and our online school at teamembassy.com. All rights reserved under applicable law. For details, please see our copyright policy on our website. Again, that's forgive123.com.